much, Lisa. I appreciate it. I hope that you can hear me and, and that the audio is improving. Um, I'm going to be talking about molecular diagnostics for TB, what are NATs, nucleic acid amplification tests, and how do you use them. Uh, it doesn't advance. First off, I'm going to be talking this an outline of my presentation. We're going to talk about what are NATs, what is the add value of doing a nucleic acid amplification test. Then we're going to discuss the specific NATs that are commercially available for detecting tuberculosis. What are the limitations of NATs? How do NATs perform in patients who are both AFB smear positive and those who are AFB smear negative? I'll talk a little bit about uh, the use of NATs in California with some data that we have recently looked at, and then close with some case examples, and then a short introduction to molecular tests for uh, drug susceptibility testing before I turn it over to uh, Dr. Berry. First, as you know, tuberculosis is a disease that is typically fatal if not treated, but the treatment itself is rigorous involving multiple drugs that have the potential for not only unpleasant, but serious and even fatal side effects. The clinical goal is to treat the disease if present as early as possible, to avoid death and disability, but not to expose patients to the risk of serious side effects of treatment if tuberculosis is not present. And the public health goal, equally important, is to find and treat cases as early as possible in order to interrupt transmission to others. Well, 30 years ago, actually 20 years ago, there were really only two tests available for diagnosing tuberculosis. There was the acid fast bacillus, or AFB smear, which was prone to false negatives. It missed 40% of subsequently culture positive cases of active TB. But equally important, false positives and particularly in areas of the country um, where non-tuberculous mycobacteria are quite prevalent, um, a positive smear might be actually more likely to be an NTM rather than tuberculosis. Uh, and in addition, of course, the gold standard was culture on solid media. The average time to positive growth, though, was three to six weeks, and at that point you still needed to do biochemical tests to determine if it was tuberculosis or an NTM, taking another several weeks before you had a definitive diagnosis. What was clearly needed to meet our goals were tests that were more sensitive, specific, and faster. Are NATs the answer? So first off, what is a NAT? It stands for Nucleic Acid Amplification Test. It's done generally on a direct clinical specimen, typically, of course, sputum but also it can be done on other clinical specimens such as central nervous, uh, uh, CSF, lymph node aspirates, et cetera, et cetera. It's more, the NAT test is more sensitive and more specific than the AFB smear. Results are available within hours to a few days. The CDC updated their guidelines for using NATs in the MMWR in 2009 stating CDC recommends that NAA, nucleic, nucleic acid amplification testing, be performed on at least one respiratory specimen for each patient with signs and symptoms of pulmonary tuberculosis, with a little caveat if the result will impact clinical or public health action. Why aren't we using NATs more <coughs> frequently? What is the added value of a NAT? Well, briefly, for an AFB smear negative patient, you can, it gives you the ability to rapidly confirm the presence of mycobacterium tuberculosis in 50 to 80 percent of AFB smear negative subsequently culture positive specimens, so much more sensitive than the smear. And in addition, if both the AFB smear and the NAT are negative, the likelihood of tuberculosis becomes very low and generally would obviate the need for contact investigation, et cetera. Looking again at AFB smear positive patients, 
there's a much greater positive predictive value with AFE smear positive specimens, greater than 95%, significantly greater than that in many settings, in which NTMs are common. If the NAT is negative in a smear positive patient, as I said, in many instances, this can also obviate the need for contact investigation. There are two commercially available NATs. The Amplified Mycobacterium tuberculosis direct test, or the MTD, made by GenProbe, and the Expert MTD slash RIF test, often called Gene Expert, made by Cepheid. We here in California also have available to us pyro sequencing. And then there are homebrews that hospital labs and some public health labs have developed. Um, to detect tuberculosis. I'm not going to be discussing those because there's so much variability. Let's start with the GenProbe MTD test. This was the first FDA-approved NAT for mycobacterium tuberculosis. It was approved way back in 1995, that's why I said 20 years, for AFB smear positive patients. In 1999, an enhanced MTD test was approved by the FDA for use in AFB smear negative specimens as well. The MTD test is a transcription-mediated amplification, and it targets the ribosomal RNA of MTB, of which there's a thousand copies or so in every mycobacterium. The sensitivity of the MTD test in culture-positive specimens is quite good. Um, smear negative, approximately 70% sensitive, and in smear positive specimens, 97% sensitive. The specificity is 98%, so almost 100%. It was, however, a somewhat and still is labor intense, intensive for the microbiologist and not an easy test to do and was therefore often not available in hospital labs. While processing time for the EMTD test is fairly rapid, less than three hours, it is an older type of NAT and does require experienced clinical laboratory technologists to perform the assay. The expert MTD risk test, otherwise called again the gene expert, was FDA approved in 2013 for detection of MTB in clinical specimens. It can be used for both AFB smear positive and smear negative, just like the enhanced MTDB test. Using culture as the gold standard, a recent meta-analysis done by Chang, this was published in 2012, showed a pool, pooled sorry, sensitivity estimate of 98% for smear positive specimens and 68% for smear negative specimens. The specificity estimates were 99%. Because most studies included in this meta-analysis were done in high TB burden countries, the sensitivity may be lower in the US. I should mention, and we'll be talking about this again in the context of drug resistance, because this test also tests for rifampin resistance. Stone published uh, in 2014 the experience in Montreal, Canada of the gene expert in a low TB incidence, high resource setting. They looked at 502 consecutive patients in a university hospital affiliated tuberculosis clinic. These were patients who might be comparable, for example, to class B immigrants that we evaluate here in the US in the immigration or refugee process. Most of their patients had abnormal chest x-rays, and this is a little bit of a typo. It should be 18% were symptomatic. Only 18% were symptomatic. Um, of these 500 consecutive patients, about 5% or 25 had subsequent culture positive tuberculosis proven. The overall sensitivity of the gene expert was 46% in this setting, 86% if smear positive, and only 28% if smear negative. But the specificity did 
um, stay very high with 100% for these 25 isolates. Of note, those patients who were subsequently culture positive but had an initial gene expert negative took twice as long for cultures to grow than those who were gene expert positive, really suggesting that there was a very, very low organism load and they also had minimal disease on chest x-ray, really implying that the transmission rate risk was very, very, very low for these individuals. The gene expert is an automated cartridge-based test. It uses PCR technology in a self-contained capsule, so contamination is, the chance for contamination is eliminated. Results are available in under two hours, and very important, the platform for using the Gene Expert is widely available in many hospital labs and is used for conditions like MRSA or C. difficile testing as well. Here's how it works. The sputum is liquefied and inactivated using a two to one ratio sample reagent. Then the material is transferred, two mLs of the material is transferred into the test cartridge. Um, and this is the cartridge that's used for the MTB RIF. You see it there for you. The cartridge is then inserted into the test platform. And that's the end of hands-on work. The sample is automatically filtered and washed. Ultrasonic lysis is used um, to release DNA. The DNA molecules then are mixed with the dry PCR reagents, and a semi-nested real-time amplification and detecting, detection is in an integrated re uh, resection tube. And you get a printable test result in one hour and 45 minutes. Quite an effective system. Here in California, we've had available to us since 2012 pyrosequencing. Although we usually use pyrosequencing for detecting mutations that are associated with drug resistance, it is also a NAT test and can be used on clinical specimens if it is at least an AFB smear, po smear positive 1 plus. The result is again available in one day. Typically at the California MDL lab, we batch it twice weekly. Um, however, the Chief Technician there, Grace Lynn, will run it for you on any workday if the need is urgent. It's a real-time PCR, has two components, um, a system to monitor the PCR product, and there are no post-PCR manipulations. It's fast, no chance for amplicon contamination. Again, a highly effective test. But NATs are not perfect. There are limitations, and it is very important that we know, you know what these limitations are. The first one that I'm going to talk about is the presence of inhibitors. Direct clinical specimens are, can contain inhibitors that prevent the PCR amplification process and will result in false negative results. The Gene Expert MTB, MTB RIF assay includes an SPC or a sample processing control that will monitor automatically for the presence of inhibitors. The MTD procedure manual also includes instructions on how to test for inhibitors and a kit for how to do it, and good labs will do it automatically. But if you have an AFB smear positive specimen that is NAT negative, make sure that the lab checked for inhibitors and repeat the NAT on another specimen. However, the second point is also important in terms of limitations. None of these tests will tell you if organisms are alive or dead, and they should not be used to follow patients who are already on treatment. And often, a NAT will stay positive long after cultures are negative. Now I'm going to turn to 
the effects of NAP use on clinical care here in California. And I'm going to say with the hard work of uh, an MPH student intern, Gianna Peralta, that we had with us at the California branch, uh, Lisa Pascapella and Penn and Berry uh, have come up again looking at um, the effect of NAP in California. We've had available to us in California since 2010 information about NAP usage that has been collected routinely on the RVCT that all of us turn in you know, for our verified cases of tuberculosis. We looked at the utilization of NAP from 2010 through 2013. Overall, 39%, a little less than 40% of subsequently culture positive patients had a NAT reported before culture results were reported. And did the use of that NAT affect clinical care? We think it probably did. This slide shows um, the, que the answer really to the question, did patients who had a NAT done start treatment earlier than those who did not have a NAT done? The first timeline you see above is you know, the first circle is the date of the first earliest specimen collection, and the second circle is when treatment was initiated. With a NAT report, treatment was started uh, earlier than those without a NAT report. Overall, the median time to beginning treatment uh, after the earliest specimen collection was three days for those with a NAT and 14 days for those without a NAT. This is a highly significant result. For smear positive specimens, the difference was also present, two days versus four days, still very statistically significant because the numbers, as you can see, are very large, but probably not so clinically significant. But for smear negatives, the difference was a median time of 10 days versus 26 days. Again, highly statistically significant, but also, I would say, highly clinically significant because we are talking about a delay of over two weeks a difference between those who had a NAT and those without a NAT. But why was it even that length? We wanted really to look at how rapidly were tests being reported? What was the turnaround time when a NAT was ordered? Now, I've already told you these tests take less than a day to run, but of course, the real world is different. You have to get the specimen to the lab, you have to decide to send it to the lab, the lab has to be open, etc. So this bar graph shows um, that how rapidly NATs were reported among 1,878 cases who had had a NAT and who started treatment before the culture was reported, and the median turnaround time was three days with a mean of a little close to four days. Um, but as you can see, the large majority did have a result reported back within four working days, but with a long tail, and some reported much later. NATs can also imp uh, influence the utilization of airborne isolation rooms and clinical care. Uh, Marx published a study in 2013 sponsored by the CDC in a retrospective multi-site study that found that using NATs was associated with significant reductions in the, both the use of airborne infection isolation rooms reductions in the use of diagnostic procedures, such as bronchoscopies and CTs, also significant reductions in the initiation of contact investigations for smear positive but culture, subsequently culture negative suspects, a reduction in the time to diagnosis of tuberculosis in smear positive cases, and because of these side effects we mentioned of treatment, also, I think this is also important, a significant reduction in the duration of presumptive TB treatment for patients who, in fact, did not have tuberculosis. 
Now I'm going to switch gears a little bit. I'm, first, I'm going to present a theoretical case and look at what might happen if certain results come up and if other results turn out. And then we're going to talk about a couple cases um, that are real cases, so to speak. So here we have the chest x-ray of a 48-year-old man with COPD. He has a history of one month of cough. He's had some weight loss. Unfortunately, he's in jail. He had treatment for TB 15 years ago. Let's say, we're just making an assumption now, that this patient had sputums ordered and was smear positive. Is this TB? There are 150 jail contacts. You know, what should we do now? Well, that chest x-ray could be old tuberculosis. It could certainly be a current reactivation of tuberculosis. Or it could be a new process entirely un, you know, unassociated with TB. If the NAT test in this individual is positive, the diagnosis is confirmed. Previous treatment 15 years ago will not give a positive result now. I remember I did tell you that it's not a way to follow patients on treatment, but 15 years, you're safe. But if the NAT test should be negative, um, that would make it much more likely that this is an NTM, which is actually quite common in COPD. But could it be a false negative NAT? You have to check for inhibitors, and you should repeat the NAT on another specimen. Let's go back to the same x-ray, and we're going to change the scenario a little bit. Again, you see the fibronodular changes in the right upper lobe. Um, same history, one month cough, weight loss, jail inmate, treated for TB 15 years ago. But let's say he's smear negative instead. So now, well, about 70% of smear negative specimens that subsequently grow M tuberculosis will be NAT positive with either the enhanced MTD test or the expert MTB RIF test. So if you do have a high index of suspicion, and certainly this case would fall into that category, a NAT test should be ordered to try to up that ante. Let's go on to a second case. This is a 56-year-old uh, Caucasian woman from a small town in Northern California. She had never traveled outside of the United States, had no known tuberculosis exposure. There had not been a case of TB in her county for the past five years. But she was a 40-pack year smoker, had been coughing for several months with some recent weight loss. She had an abnormal x-ray, which I'll show you in a minute. She was a social worker and had many, many clients that she worked with uh, in their homes. This was her chest x-ray, and it was a little bit of a surprise to her clinicians. As you can see, there's quite extensive changes in the left upper lobe um, with a quite a good-sized cavity and another apical smaller cavity, very worrisome. Sputa were ordered and were AFB smear positive times three. The health department was consulted and a NAT was suggested, but the NAT was negative. Well, is this a false negative NAT? Does this woman, without any risk factors, have tuberculosis? Or is this a true negative? How are we going to answer that question? The lab was requested to check for inhibitors, and none were found. 
the match was repeated on another smear positive specimen, and it was again negative. Out of caution, and I certainly wouldn't fault this, treatment with rifampin, isoniazid, pyrazinamide, and ephambutol, a standard regimen, was begun, but the county held off on any contact evaluation beyond the immediate family of one person and did not look into her occupational exposures, but she did as I mean, her exposure to those that she worked with in her occupation. And subsequently, the culture grew actually quite quickly because these were smear positive specimens, but it was identified as M. cansasii and NTM and could be identified very quickly on the culture because cultures you can probe for MTB, M. cansasii, Mycobacterium avium, and M. gordoni. So they had an answer fairly quickly. And in this case, no further contact investigation was done and no further public, out, public health action was needed. So it was very helpful and certainly made more sense in the context of you know, her lack of any exposure to tuberculosis. Here we'll go into another case. This is a 44-year-old man, originally from Mexico, who was applying for work as a maintenance worker at a hospital. He needed to have screening for tuberculosis, and a TST was done, and it was positive at 28 millimeters. He did, however, have a 20-pack year history of smoking. He had complained of some cough for several weeks. It was occasionally productive, but no fever, no sweats, no weight loss. He also had an abnormal chest x-ray. As you can see on this chest x-ray, a mass-like infiltrate was seen in the periphery of the left upper lobe. He also had a little bit of hyperinflation, which would go along also with the smoking history. Of course, tuberculosis was a consideration but remember, this man also had a smoking history. So there are, you know, cancer was also a consideration in the, diag in, in the diagnostic algorithm. He had a sputum ordered for AFB, acid fast bacilli. All three were negative. He was scheduled for bronchoscopy because of the concern for malignancy, but a gene expert MTB RIF was ordered, and it was positive. The bronchoscopy was canceled, and four drug therapy, standard RIPE, was begun on this patient. The chest x ray two months later, oops, there it is, okay, showed significant clearing of the left apical infiltrate nodule. People were obviously quite happy with that, as I would be. He had marked improvement in the chest x-ray. And after 21 days, the culture was positive and was then acuprobe positive for MTB. So this gentleman was spared an invasive procedure. And because the diagnosis was made much more quickly and without an invasive procedure, fewer persons were potentially exposed to tuberculosis. I'm going to shift now. So just to summarize quickly, NAP technology for diagnosing TB is underutilized. As I said, less than 40% of patients in California who are proven culture positive TB had the benefit of a NAP. NAPs are more sensitive than AFB smears for detecting TB, significantly more sensitive. The time for treatment initiation is shorter when NAPs are used. More frequent use of NAPs for the tuberculosis diagnosis can affect both clinical care and public health action. We think that the recent FDA approval of the gene expert MTB RIF assay will probably increase NAP use um, in California and within the hospital. So we hope that that will be the case. Now shifting gears a little bit, I'm going to give a little bit of an introduction to rapid molecular testing <coughs> for uh, 
drug susceptibility testing. As I said before, the treatment of TB is rigorous, but you know, MDR-TB treatment is even more so. Again, the clinical goal is to treat MDR-TB if present as early as possible, but not to expose patients to the even more significant side effects of treatment with, for MDR-TB if it's not present. And again, the public health goal is to find and treat cases as early as possible in order to interrupt transmission to others. Phenotypic DSTs have been done for 100 years. The gold standard is auger proportion method on solid media. It's very slow and seldom used now. The midget liquid system is now in common use, but it takes about a week after a positive culture for phenotypic DSTs to be reported out. Molecular DSTs, we now have several different methodologies um, to have a much more rapid turnaround time. Well, I'm going to talk a little bit about pyrosequencing, line probe assays, the expert MTD RIF, and the CDC's MDDR service, um, but only in short detail before I turn it over to Dr. Barry uh, to give you more, much more information about this. Pyrosequencing, as I said before, has been available at the California State Lab since 2012. It's performed on cultures or clinical specimens if at least one plus AFB positive. The result is available in one day. Again, as I say, usually batched, but Grace Lynn at the lab will run it for you any workday if urgent. It tests for INH mutations, INHA, CATG, and AHPC and rifampin RPOB resistance mutations, as well as mutations found in resistance to quinolones, the gyrase A, and injectable drugs, RRS. Its sensitivity, it'll pick up about 90% of INH-resistant isolates and over 95% of rifampin-resistant isolates, and its specificity is over 95% for both INH and rifampin resistance. The Hain test is commercially available and used in much of the world, but it is not FDA approved in the United States. It is a line probe assay. It detects INH and rifampin resistance, and the second generation test also looks for resistance to quinolones and injectable drugs. It's a line probe assay. The results show bands on a nitrocellulose strip. Absence of a band suggests the presence of a mutation. The gene expert MTB RIF doesn't just detect mycobacterium tuberculosis DNA, it also tests for rifampin resistance using a molecular beacon technology. In Chang's 2012 meta-analysis, using cultures and phenotypic drug susceptibility tests as the gold standard, the expert assay had a pooled sensitivity of 95% and specificity of 98% for detecting rifampin resistance. Since uh, 2010, the Centers for Disease Control has had an MDDR service available to us. It stands for Molecular Detection of Drug Resistance. It's intended primarily for patients with MDR-TB who will be treated for second-line drugs. It uses DNA sequencing to find mutations associated with INH and rifampin, ethambutol and pyrazinamide, fluoroquinolones, levofloxacin and moxifloxacin, aminoglycosides, and capriomycin. It has an excellent turnaround of less than 48 hours. In years past, it was only available for positive cultures, but uh, within the past year, it has also become available for smear positive specimens that are also NAC positive. So before I close, I would like to acknowledge and thank uh, Dr. Berry, Dr. Amit Chitnis, also from the TB branch, formerly from the TB branch, um, Ed Desmond and Grace Lynn from the MDL uh, laboratory, Lisa Pascapella and Gianna Peralta, and the whole TB branch of the California Department of Public Health. And I will now turn it over to Dr. Pennon Berry. 
Terrific. Thank you, Gisela. We're just switching here, getting Penn in, uh, in the driver's seat, and uh, hopefully you So, Penn, take it away. <clears throat> Thanks. So, my charge today <clears throat> is to extend what uh, Gisela has already uh, presented and talk about um, testing for drug resistance mutations. <clears throat> so, the stated objective is to talk about who you should test with a molecular test for uh, drug resistance. But I'm also going to talk about, uh, uh, add a little bit of detail to what Gisela has already told you about the types of tests, um, state uh, some of the benefits of the test, then talk about who you should test, how to interpret the results using uh, a couple of example cases, and then I'm going to spend a little bit of time about some emerging uh, areas for, uh, for caution. First, uh, I think already in our presentation, you've heard a couple of different uh, terms for uh, the two uh, major uh, types of susceptibility tests. And I just wanted to put them here on the slide. Uh, Growth-based susceptibility tests are the same as culture-based susceptibility tests or phenotypic susceptibility tests. And often, we call them just simply DSPs. Molecular tests for drug resistance, uh, people often call them molecular susceptibility tests, genotypic susceptibility tests, or even molecular DSTs. Um, I'm going to try to stick with molecular tests for drug resistance in this presentation. So adding to uh, what Gisela has already told you about the tests that are available, um, I'd like to divide the tests that are available into those that are uh, non-sequencing tests meaning that they report the presence of a mutation, but not necessarily which specific mutation is present uh, in most cases. This includes the uh, expert mtb RIF assay that's FDA authorized. It also includes the uh, two uh, types of Hein line probe assays as well as the Inogenetics uh, line probe assay. And it, uh, for the most part, will include laboratory-developed tests or those homebrew tests that Gisela has already told you about. Sequencing um, is the other large category of molecular tests for drug resistance. And in that category, I'd put pyro sequencing, which you've already heard is available in California. It's also available in New York, and I believe in a couple of other public health labs in the country. And sequencing is also what is done for CDC's molecular detection of drug resistance. Lastly, I put here whole genome sequencing, which is not uh, yet standard of care uh, and is not primarily done to identify molecular tests for drug resistance, but uh, will give the same information uh, about uh, drug resistance associated mutations. This slide, I'm not going to go over in detail, but I wanted to remind you again about the different uh, genes uh, that there are assays um, for and the drugs um, for which uh, susceptibility or resistance um, can, be, uh, can be determined. The sensitivity and specificity data here is for uh, primarily from uh, the MDDR service. Um, and thus is uh, for sequencing-based tests. And in the right column, you can see the different assays um, and the different uh, genes and drugs uh, for which they test. I'm going to focus today mostly on uh, RPOB testing, which you can see in uh, the fourth row there um, does have um, the highest uh, sensitivity and specificity um, of these drug tests. Now, the reason that uh, knowing the exact mutation can be helpful in determining and interpreting the results of uh, molecular tests for drug resistance is uh, in large part here. So I don't want to get uh, too molecular biologically detailed, but um, I want to introduce the concept of uh, silent mutations as opposed to missense mutations. Now, both of these are mutations, so there's a nucleic acid change um, that, uh, that is present in both. In a silent mutation, however, there's no resultant amino acid change. Um, and because of that, it's not associated with drug resistance in general. And I've listed here that the most common silent mutation in RPOB is the one at codon 514. 
in which the DNA is altered from the code TTC to the code TTT, but both TTC and TTT code for the same amino acid. Now, <clears throat> in contrast to that, missense mutations, there's a nucleic acid change, <clears throat> but there's also an uh, amino acid change. And many of these uh, changes uh, are associated with uh, drug resistance, but not all are. I think it's important um, to just know that when you have a missense mutation that is not associated with uh, resistance as measured by a growth-based assay, that uh, is not a silent mutation. So I'm going to focus, and uh, some of our assays, of course, the expert assay in particular, has focused on testing specifically for rifampin. And the reason for that makes sense. Rifampin is the cornerstone of our TB treatment. If there's resistance, unlike resistance to INH, it does require quite a longer duration of therapy. And in general, because rifampin resistance without INH resistance is rare, rifampin resistance, when identified in uh, most cases, should be considered to be MDRTB unless uh, proven otherwise. On this slide, I'm uh, showing a diagram of the expert assay and the coverage of the five probes used in the assay to cover the, uh, this portion of the RPOB gene um, in which most of the mutations conferring rifampin resistance are present. So you can see the five probes labeled A through E there in the different colored bars. Um, in addition, uh, each codon is labeled with a number in the middle, and you can see the genetic code is listed out in, uh, with its base pair uh, designations um, there. So what I'm going to add uh, here, um, and this is um, data just from the California lab, um, of the locations of mutations that are missense mutations identified throughout uh, this segment of the RPOB gene. We have labeled the most common resistance mutation, 531 TTG, which shows up in uh, probe E. <clears throat> but you can see that there are resistance mutations throughout um, all uh, probes here. What I'm going to add in blue are the locations of these silent mutations that I've been um, discussing. Now, the most common silent mutation I've already introduced to you would show up in probe B. But you can also see that there are locations uh, for silent mutations in other probes. And what this means is that when expert gives a, a result of uh, rifampin resistance, you're not able to tell from that uh, result immediately, in most cases, whether this is a silent mutation or a missense uh, mutation. And thus the recommendation that uh, all results from expert or other non-sequencing tests um, get confirmed with a sequencing test so you can make um, this determination and distinguish uh, between these results. This is an example of uh, what the uh, laboratory sees when they run the expert and they get a result. Uh, in this example, you can see that uh, this person had MTB detected and rifampin resistance was detected. If I blow up these curves, you can see the top curve is a positive control. Um, the next four lines um, rising from baseline are uh, four probes that I showed you in the, in the prior example. You can see the bottom line in brown corresponds to probe A, um, which did not increase in uh, fluorescence. Um, molecular beacons did not bind there. And that means that uh, the mutation for this person's um, and this person's isolate occurred uh, in that part of the RPOB gene covered by probe A. Keith has already uh, showed uh, one uh, meta-analysis result for a performance of expert uh, with rifampin resistance. This is one uh, performed by the Cochrane Review, uh, updated in 2014, showing uh, nearly identical results. Very sensitive, 95%, with a pooled median specificity of 98%. Well, in some ways, the benefits, I think, of molecular tests for drug resistance uh, may be uh, somewhat obvious. 
Um, but uh, the idea is that it reduces time to detection of resistance. You don't have to wait for the growth-based test uh, to give you a result that can take uh, several weeks. And in fact, uh, when we looked at data um, from the molecular beacons assay that was uh, used in California prior to pyrus sequencing, we found that the time from empiric or first-line treatment um, to the start of MDR-TB treatment um, was 40 days less in patients uh, who had molecular beacons testing. Now what this uh, means likely is that there uh, may be less transmission of drug-resistant TB during that, that time when you uh, don't know that you're dealing with uh, MDR, drug-resistant TB. Um, there could be less acquired resistance from uh, use of that empiric uh, regimen while your uh, growth-based BSTs are pending. Um, and there may be uh, less ineffective LTBI treatment uh, given to contacts, particularly high-risk uh, infected contacts during that time. Now there are some risks of molecular tests for drug resistance. I don't want to overstate these. Um, there can be uh, some costs associated um, with the uh, assays. There can be some confusion generated. Um, you may be feeling that now with my uh, discussion of silent mutations and missense mutations. Um, um, and sometimes interpreting these results uh, can be confusing. Um, and sometimes there can be uh, possible exposure that's unneeded to second-line drugs. Um, However, so uh, I think uh, there are, the benefits are, are clear in the, in the right population, and so the next part of my talk, I'm going to talk about um, who um, you should use these assays um, to test. Well, I think <clears throat> many of us would think um, that we should use that uh, among persons who are at increased risk for MDR-TB. Um, so who are those, those folks? So in California, um, we uh, consider uh, foreign-born patients from countries or groups with high prevalence of, of MDR-TB uh, should be, uh, have a molecular test for drug resistance. And in California, we consider these groups to be uh, Hmong refugees, uh, those with uh, Tibetan ancestry, and immigrants from uh, the former Soviet republics, Laos, Burma, Korea, Peru, Central America, and India. I'll show you the data upon which uh, this is based, um, as well as recent immigrants, um, for example, within uh, the last two years. Um, and I'll show you some data, uh, especially from China, Vietnam, and Philippines. So this is a table of uh, how we have uh, generated that list that I uh, just uh, showed you. Um, this is uh, data from California on the proportion of uh, cases that are MDR-TB among uh, persons by, uh, by country or region of origin for uh, the last five years. And see, I don't think it's a surprise that the former Soviet republics topped the list with 14.5% uh, of uh, those cases uh, having MDR. You can see these are ordered uh, by percent, and at the bottom uh, are U.S.-born persons with a uh, proportion of about a half a percent. Um, usually, you may uh, notice that uh, in the list, the, we drew the line approximately at 2 percent um, prevalence, and the reason is because when I add the positive predictive values, uh, these two columns using an assumed specificity of 99% in the yellow column or 98% in the green column, you can see that at 2%, a uh, rifampin resistance result um, in a population with 2% prevalence of MDR, um, two-thirds of those uh, will be uh, real uh, rifampin resistance as determined by phenotypic or uh, growth-based susceptibility test for a test of 99% specificity. You heard that uh, both the meta-analysis uh, showed that in expert, uh, there was 98% specificity, and in those persons uh, with a rifampin resistance um, result, about half of those uh, will have growth-based uh, resistance um, um, to rifampin identified. Um, equally important, I think, is coming down uh, further in the list, so commonly, in California, we see cases of TB from Mexico and from China. 
And really the positive predict predictive value in that population because of the prevalence of MDR-TB um, is much lower. Now, when we, uh, we also made a recommendation about uh, recent uh, immigrants from these countries. And if you look in the top line, you can see that actually recent immigrants uh, during the last two years have an MDR prevalence of 3.3%, uh, so above that um, rough 2% uh, uh, threshold um, that we have chosen. But when you break it down by country, um, you can see the three countries that did not reach the 2% threshold when considering all comers um, are uh, the MDR uh, prevalence among that group uh, when uh, broken down by recent immigrants um, is much higher and thus um, the basis for our recommendations in California. Say that um, if you're not in California, um, looking at uh, similar um, analysis uh, may be helpful. Um, um, to, in making a uh, specific recommendation in your location. Now certainly these aren't the only groups with uh, increased risk for MDR-TB, so others uh, that we usually think about are those with a history of uh, previous TB treatment, particularly if that uh, treatment is recent. A poor response to standard four drug uh, treatment um, and usually the definition for that is the culture remaining positive after uh, two or so months of treatment. Caveat here is that uh, you recall Gisla telling you that a NAT test will not determine whether the organism is alive or dead, but in this context, a uh, NAT with, that shows a previously unappreciated or unrecognized resistance mutation uh, may be cut quite consequential and uh, useful in uh, treating your case. Of course, known exposure to MDR-TB, um, as well as HIV-positive persons um, who have a higher incidence of rifampin monoresistance, as well as uh, associated uh, MDR-TB. Um, I'm also going to list uh, here some other indications for molecular resistance testing that do not uh, relate to increased risk of uh, drug-resistant tests. Uh, or drug resistance, but uh, an increased, uh, what I'm calling, stakes of drug resistance. So listed here are when unrecognized drug resistance could have a large impact on uh, contact investigations, on treatment of uh, vulnerable uh, contacts, or even um, among your uh, index case who uh, could rapidly progress or worsen while you're waiting for a growth-based susceptibility test. In the, in the lower uh, row is also some laboratory reasons for using molecular tests for drug resistance, and those include mixed cultures in which um, if you're able to get a growth-based uh, susceptibility test, it usually is uh, quite delayed, as well as cases that are smear positive um, but uh, culture negative in whom you really uh, believe clinically that the patient has uh, TB. I'm going to switch gears um, and give you some examples of how to interpret uh, results of molecular tests uh, for resistance. So in my first case uh, that I'm going to present is a 70-year-old asymptomatic, asymptomatic man from India with an abnormal pre-immigration chest x-ray but no prior uh, TB history. He had a repeat domestic chest x-ray after immigration that showed multifocal infiltrate. Um, it was worse from his pre-immigration chest x-ray and sputum smear uh, were positive uh, times three. Um, an expert uh, assay was, uh, was done, was positive, and uh, the rifampin resistance uh, was identified with experts. So what do we do next with that? Should we start MDR treatment uh, based on the expert results? Should we order pyrosequencing or MDDR? Start uh, first-line drugs, um, waiting for our sequencing um, assay to come back or uh, growth-based tests to come back? Should we repeat expert? Should we start treatment for mono-rifampin resistance? 
Well, I think here I've already said that uh, we'd want to order a sequencing-based test so we can ensure that we're not dealing with a uh, silent mutation. Um, also, we're able to get a little bit of additional information on specific uh, uh, mutations. Um, you could start MDR treatment, particularly, particularly if you're uh, pressed uh, clinically. Um, but in this asymptomatic patient, um, treatment was held uh, because a pyrosequencing result would be available within two days. And these are pyrosequencing results here. There was an INH, uh, INH resistance mutation identified in uh, the CAT-G gene. There was an RPOB uh, mutation identified, which does confer uh, rifampin resistance, and no other mutations were identified. Well, so now what do we do? Do you start MDR treatment? Should we still order MDDR um, to get a couple of additional information on a couple of additional drugs? Um, do we still want to consider first-line drugs? Do we repeat a uh, specimen? Order second-line drugs? Or maybe we could just cancel all our GSTs because we ha already have some molecular results. Um, so uh, some of those options are, are tongue-in-cheek, clearly. Um, but uh, in this patient, uh, I think now we should go ahead and start uh, MDR treatment. You may want to consider in some cases uh, going on to order MDDR because you could get uh, some early indication of a thamutol and pyrazinamide resistance, but that's not always necessary. But certainly um, this would be an indication to uh, get a jump on ordering your second line drug susceptibility test because those will be very important in managing this MDR uh, case in the future. So a similar case where I've altered uh, just a few uh, characteristics of, of the case. This is a 70-year-old man from Mexico. He's been in the U.S. for 25 years, now is symptomatic with four weeks of cough, but has no prior TB history. Chest x-ray is the same, showing some multifocal infiltrates sputum smear positive, expert positive, and rifampin resistant. So these are the same options that I presented uh, in the first case. Should we start MDR treatment? Should we confirm with a sequencing test? Start first-line drugs? Repeat the, uh, the test? And then here, really because of the data that I showed earlier, this is a uh, remote arriver from Mexico with a low prevalence of MDR. Uh, in California, um, we uh, potentially have some doubt about um, what the meaning of rifampin resistance results is. Um, so we would definitely want to order prior sequencing to uh, sort that out. I think um, it'd be reasonable um, if treatment needs to be started in the meantime um, to start first-line drugs um, because with a prevalence of 0.8% MDR, um, actually, the positive predictive value of this rifampin resistance result um, is quite low. So that's what happened. RIPE was started, and in fact, the pyrosequencing result uh, came back with no INH-associated mutations, so meaning likely to be INH-susceptible, uh, and in fact, uh, identifying a silent mutation in the POB gene, meaning that the expert assay was correct. That was not an incorrect um, um, identification of a mutation. It was just that the mutation um, does not confer um, resistance to rifampin. Third case, um, illustrating some other uses for, uh, for a molecular test. So this is a U.S.-born high school student who's been coughing for six months. Sputum smear positive times three, bilateral cavities on chest x-ray, expert positive, and rifampin sensitive. Certainly reassuring that uh, rifampin is uh, uh, sensitive. Um, would you start MDR treatment, though, just to be sure? Would you order prior sequencing or MDDR, um, start first-line drugs, or repeat expert on another specimen? So for here, we have rifampin sensitive. We're not really expecting uh, MDR TB. Um, but we may want to order prior sequencing or MDDR for those other drugs. Um, particularly INH, um, that uh, may become useful in the public health investigation. So this is used just for first-line drugs in the index case, but because of the large contact investigation planned with the use of the 12-dose 
uh, regimen for infected contacts anticipated. Pyro sequencing was ordered to look for INH resistance, and in this uh, situation, no INH resistance was identified. So in summary, in terms of some of uh, the tips here on how to interpret molecular tests for drug resistance, it's always important with any test to put it into your clinical and epidemiologic context. How suspicious are you of drug resistance in this, in this patient? You would like to confirm non-sequencing test results, such as you get from expert with a sequencing test, so either pyro sequencing or MDDR service. It's important to remember that uh, rifampin resistance on expert uh, should be considered MDR and not just rifampin monoresistance. And I think you can usually base your treatment on sequencing test results, but it's very important to follow the GRIF-based uh, susceptibility results as well for, um, um, for uh, other results for other drugs, as well as to confirm your molecular results. I want to finish with a few slides on um, some, I would say, emerging areas uh, for caution in interpreting molecular tests for drug resistance. Chiefly, this comes up when uh, there's discordance identified between your molecular test results and your growth-based uh, DST. Some of this uh, can arise because of disputed mutations, which I'll tell you about in a minute. But it's also important to remember that with molecular tests, they only test for mutations that we know about in genes that we know can confer resistance. And so other mutations or other causes for resistance can exist outside of the areas that the molecular tests um, are, are uh, interrogating. And uh, there can be resistance on your phenotypic uh, growth-based susceptibility test that is not identified with molecular tests. Uh, um, present a fourth case um, that uh, explains the, uh, the conundrum, really, with uh, discordant molecular versus phenotypic uh, tests. So this is a 23-year-old uh, man from Mexico who's diagnosed with smear-positive pulmonary TB. He uh, had pyrosequencing uh, testing done. Um, there was a CAT-G mutation associated with INH resistance. And there was an RPOB mutation identified. Now, this is a missense mutation at uh, codon 526. But, uh, but isolates with this mutation typically test susceptible on growth-based susceptibility tests. And the pyro sequencing report uh, at that time said not associated with rifampin or rifabutin resistance. And in fact, that was confirmed with the growth-based DSTs which identified only INH resistance, it was fully susceptible to rifampin. He was treated with rifampin, EMB, PZA by DOT for nine months, but the end of treatment sputum showed smear and uh, culture positivity. And in fact, uh, he was reinitiated on treatment with an MDR um, regimen. Around this time, um, several uh, case series or case reports uh, were published um, from predominantly from the international literature um, showing uh, uh, or reporting this uh, situation where uh, growth-based susceptibility tests show susceptible, um, but molecular tests for FAMPIN um, identify a, uh, a mutation. To uh, summarize uh, some of this literature, um, they've identified uh, mutations associated with the cordon, discordance and found that when patients were followed clinically, there was a high rate of treatment failure uh, in these patients. Um, almost all of the patients reported were also INH resistant. Um, and the conclusions of authors of the, the various uh, reports were that perhaps phenotypic DST should not be the gold standard. Um, and that these mutations that uh, are identified in discordance um, may have clinical significance. Now, most of these studies were from high incidence settings, and most cases were uh, among cases who uh, were undergoing their second round of, of treatment um, for drug-susceptible TB. So we weren't sure uh, how generalizable this would be to, uh, to California. 
but we investigated and we're in the process of investigating um, cases. We've identified 17 cases with um, discordance and rifampin. Almost all of those cases, similar to the literature, have INH resistance, and at least our preliminary review um, showed some potential poor outcomes associated with certain mutations. Certainly on the MDR service in California, um, this has, um, has led us to um, take these mutations uh, much more seriously than we had in the past, and the PIR sequencing report um, with uh, these mutations has been altered um, to uh, suggest uh, consultation. So that would be my recommendation, would be to consult your MDR experts when you identify a rare mutation um, uh, because MDR treatment um, could be considered. This is an area of, uh, I think, emerging um, experience, and there's still a lot of questions, um, but I wanted um, folks on the webinar to uh, be aware um, that this is an active area of investigation and debate. So in summary for my whole presentation, just to remind you um, that the benefits of these assays is that drug resistance can be identified faster, often quite a bit faster, with molecular tests, and that can have many benefits. Um, but remind you to confirm your non-sequencing results from expert with a sequencing-based assay because um, you need to be aware of the silent mutations that could be uh, present. Keep the clinical picture in mind and investigate further if your result is, is unexpected. And certainly consult the experts uh, if you're having troubles interpreting um, your results and particular for unusual mutations. Like Isla, I'd like to uh, thank my colleagues at the California uh, TB branch um, as well as in the uh, California Public Health uh, Mycobacteriology Laboratory. Thanks. Well, terrific. Thank you very much, Penn. And I do want to acknowledge that some of you uh, continue to have had audio problems on and off, uh, while others have had um, fine audio throughout. Um, so I just want to make sure I let you know that we will be posting a recorded version uh, of these talks um, online, um, hopefully in the next few weeks, uh, and we'll let you know. But I'm very sorry, it's not entirely clear why there's been so much variability on different people's phone lines and currently through the computer for some of you, I believe. Um, so we have 15 minutes for questions, which is fabulous. Uh, I think it'd be fun to get into a discussion session on this. Uh, we will take questions both via chat, if you want to do it on the computer, as well as through the phone service. If you are calling in a question, remember to, um, or you're on the phone right now, star six to unmute. Um, I'll give you a second to figure that out. And um, going first to anyone who wants to ask a phone question, please feel free. <coughs> And um, while we're waiting, I do know there were two comments that came up during the talk. One was Pete Dupree. Thank you very much for uh, reminding us that Colorado does have a pyro sequencing service now. And I think those of you in that state uh, should take advantage of it because in California it's been hugely um, successful. successful. Yeah, very, very, very helpful. Um, and the other question that came up right off the bat, what's the general cost? of a NAT, you know, I don't know, expert versus uh, the homegrown. I don't know if we really have information on that or? Uh, a reasonable cost for a laboratory would be in the, in the range of about $80 um, for an MTD test, about the same for a gene expert. The cartridge itself, uh, I believe, is $18. The, for the for the gene expert cartridge, but of course, you know, there's technician time to put into that as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. well, thank you, Gisela. Uh, do I hear somebody who may have a phone question right now? Hi, this is Felicia Dworkin in New York City. Hi. Hi. Um, the question I have is the data that was presented for the NAT, is that only on sputum or is it also for tissue specimens? 
That's an excellent question. Um, that data was on sputum in terms of sensitivity and specificity, but there is data available um, on other specimens, uh, such as CSF, uh, lymph node aspirates, etc., cetera, um, where the sensitivity is in the range of around 80%. Uh, apparently, pleural fluid is a little bit of an exception where the sensitivity is a little less than 50%. It's in the 40s. So it, and, it, and it is... Finish. Go ahead. No, my question oh. was also, are you also doing NAAs on, um, and gene expert on tissue specimens? Because in New York City, right now, we're not doing that yet. So, uh, it depends on the lab and what uh, the lab uh, has validated and is comfortable reporting. I know uh, in California labs, some of which will uh, do it gladly, others uh, have decided not to uh, validate or report out um, results from NAA testing. So I think it uh, depends on the lab. Thank you. We have certainly in California done pyrosequencing on, on non-sputum specimens quite frequently. We do it also, but only if under special request, because right now we're not validated to do it on tissue specimens. Right. And the, and the data is out there. Some data is out there, but it's still pretty limited. Um, but, I, you know, I, I think we're really lucky that we've got labs that are responsive to our requests on a case-by-case -case basis. And certainly a positive result, I think, is quite helpful. Um, in your clinical judgment. And I think a lot of, you know, we were talking amongst ourselves even before uh, we went live in the webinar, and, and I think one of the things to remember, these are really powerful tools. I think we should be using them more often. I think we have to get used to using them more often because it's not straight black and white, and it definitely, definitely still requires a fair amount of clinical judgment into whether or not you can uh, trust the result, you know, where you should wait with this single test result in your whole clinical thinking thinking and I know Gisela, we were we really were talking about that. You can't just decide based on one test. And um, don't forget to think. <laughs> um, I do see um, there are some uh, questions on chat. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna pick on one of these first and then again if there's any other uh, phone questions, uh, go ahead and gear yourself up. But from uh, Nadia Zabuwala, I think, a 65-year-old patient who's been treated in Cambodia in 2010, currently has a cough, fever, abnormal chest X-ray, which is mainly scarring, and a smear positive times three. Her NAT is positive times three, but the culture grew M fortuitum times three in 14 days. Um, no MTG after 60 days. What would you think of these results? That's fascinating. Um, that's a long time ago. Two th I think you say two th uh, 2010, so we're talking about four or five years ago that she was treated. Is it possible that the positive NAP result is still from that previous episode of TB? Um, since what you're growing now is the M42 and no TB. That's a difficult conundrum. Uh, we have seen patients at least a couple of years out from being treated for TB who still had a positive NAT where in fact nothing grew. Uh, I think at this point I would follow this patient and see how she did. Is she, has, she, has she been on treatment over that time period would be a question. I think if she had been on treatment and if she seemed to respond to treatment, I would probably finish the course of treatment. If treatment had not been started, um, then I think she could be followed and sputa repeated. M. fortuitum is a potential pathogen, but is much more likely to just be a commensal organism in the sputum. Anything to add, Tenen? No, I mean, <clears throat> I think this is a situation where you really have to, our tests are, this kind of shows the, some of the limitations of, of the test and you have to uh, kind of fall back on clinical judgment. Uh, how, how likely do you think that the clinical syndrome um, 
that the patient is having is related to TB. And if you think it is, then our tests, uh, you know, haven't uh, haven't been that helpful. Um, but uh, I would treat according to to that. Well, I I think it it does bring up again something we were talking about beforehand. It is the utility of multiple specimens. Do you improve your confidence? And in this case scenario, they actually did three NATs, and they all agreed that there was no MTD there. And so do multiple specimens enhance your confidence in the result? And I think, again, there may be some early data out there, um, the two of you were inferring to, um, but I, I don't know that we completely feel comfortable with this yet. Um, but maybe it is helpful, just like we do multiple smears to improve our confidence in the results to make, in, in order to make clinical decisions. This is a little different because this is three NAT positives. Um, it's okay. usually been looked at if there's a, a negative NAT uh, and you don't believe it, uh, that you, know, you should repeat the NAT and see and there is some data out there that um, you do increase the sensitivity somewhat um, with a second NAT, uh, but I think it is, in, in this situation, I'm not sure what the additional That's test true. is. That's true. It was positive. <laughs> positive, positive, yeah. positive. But so uh, uh, we'll hold for a minute here and see, is there anyone who's joined on the phone that has a question first? Star six to unmute. If not, okay, we've got a, a few uh, questions coming up via chat. Wendy Malone is asking, in the hypothetical case of a suspect in jail with smear and NAT negative sputum, would you initiate contact investigation or would you hold off until the culture is final? So, so let me add to this hypothetical case. Um, let's say that they're in jail but symptomatic. Uh, and he was symptomatic, yeah. coughing. Um, you're, you're now in a situation, this is a patient with a chest x-ray that looked more likely to be old scarring from old TB and not <coughs> terribly active on appearance. You have negative smears, he was symptomatic, and you also have a negative NAT. You're now at a situation where the likelihood that this, the, the prior probability, let's put it that way, that this is truly negative is pretty high and I would believe those results and ho certainly hold off until the cultures. Giza, and I think the really important piece to this is that you still went through your clinical reasoning, and what you did is you identified whether or not you thought, based on that clinical presentation, your suspicion level was high, medium, or low, and then you went on to qualify how you, you know, interpreted those results based on that. And I think that's an important thing for folks to remember, um, certainly there were, there were risks involved here, but at some point, I think we need to trust these very powerful tools without forgetting the, the need to have some clinical judgment. Right. Penn, and you're nodding your head. Anything else there? Nope. I love having these two in the room. I wish, I wish <laughs> you guys could all have us <laughs> together, but Charlie Crane, um, your question. When you advise to confirm non-sequencing results uh, with a sequencing test, does this mean to confirm only a positive non-sequencing result? So Yes. Um, so what I mean by that is, uh, yes, when you have a positive result on expert or M, uh, on expert um, or high, and if you have access to that, that shows um, rifampin resistance, uh, confirm it with a sequencing test so we can uh, rule out a silent mutation um, causing that positive test. All right. I, I think that um, a lot of people will have, so now, you know, a lot of listeners, knowing that, that a great number of our listeners are, are here in California and now um, have pyro sequencing available. Um, New York, I think, also has pyrosequencing available. Now Colorado, uh, Pete reminded us. But for many of you, it really does mean sending out to the MDDR service uh, in Atlanta to be able to get a more rapid response back. Um, so just 
that's what we mean by a sequencing test. Um, and we still debate what uh, what's the gold standard, I think, is really what this all is raising. Is it the phenotypic DSTs, or is it now our ability to more carefully sequence out? And I think that that was difficult. Um, I'm, I'm going to follow up a little bit because we did get uh, that email back from Nadia about that patient that they did choose to treat her and she did clinically improve. So I think, um, as I said before, I would certainly continue with the treatment and uh, sometimes cultures are falsely negative too for whatever reason. So uh, that's quite interesting. Thanks for letting us know. Yeah, I think, I think it's... I. I know that um, we'll probably continue these conversations and whether or not, you know, are these tests, are the molecular tests um, more sensitive than our, than our cultures? Um, you know, we treat a lot of culture negative TV in this country and could these tests be picking up those cases? Um, and, and that's, again, data that I don't know that I've seen, but it, it does start to, to raise um, these questions. Uh, in the last minute or so, there's a quickie from Sharon uh, Trian. It, can a NAT still be positive four years after treatment with standard treatment? And we're smiling because we've all <laughs> I would love to say no, but I can't <laughs> absolutely say that. Um, I can say that the general time course is that the NAT will stay positive longer than the culture. Typically that might be a few months, a few weeks to a few months. But we have seen cases where it has remained positive. Rare cases. Rare Yeah, rare cases. cases. <laughs> you know, at least two years out, and I think at four years, it's really starting to push it. Yeah, yeah. And <clears throat> there are published case reports um, um, reporting out to a couple years of uh, NAT positivity. Um, of course, in those reports, you always have to consider how did uh, how was it ruled out? But uh, in in those cases, culture remained negative, um, and so there there are a couple of case reports. One from Africa, we authored a, a recent uh, similar one as well. Well, terrific! Thanks you two. Uh, it's a blast. It's always informative. I want those of you who have questions on CMEs or uh, on how to make sure that you do your evaluations and get your credits to stay on the line and Jeannie's just going to close out with some reminders on how to how to do this but thank you all okay we will leave the chat window open for a few more minutes and if you would like to enter your questions in the chat or Q&A panel um, we will forward these questions to Diesel and Pennon then we'll compile their responses and post it on the FAQ along with the recorded webinar in a few weeks. For any group members who may not have pre-registered, please provide us with your full name and email address either by entering it also in the chat window in Adobe Connect or by sending an email to the web workshop email address And the email address is right here if you need it. And thank you for participating in this webinar. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.